Welcome. I'm Heather Campion, the CEO of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library Foundation, and, and on behalf of Tom Putnam, the library's director, and all my library and foundation colleagues, we welcome you to this remarkable national treasure. If you haven't been here before, and I don't see many unfamiliar faces in the audience, or you haven't explored this beautiful museum in a while, I'd encourage you to come back later this month when we reopen the museum after renovations we've been doing all winter, the first that we've done here in many years. The new museum will be an entirely new experience for visitors with sound and lighting and films of President Kennedy's most iconic speeches that are all being enhanced and put on much larger screens. It's our goal with this museum redesign and with all that we're doing at the foundation going forward to reintroduce President Kennedy and his powerful words to the generations of people, actually now over 80% of people in the world, who have no living memory of President Kennedy, in hopes that they too will draw inspiration and motivation to get involved in helping to make our country and our world a better place. This evening's forums and all the John F. Kennedy Library forums are free and open to the public, and they're also live streamed on our website, and this is thanks to generous support from many wonderful sponsors in Boston. Our lead sponsor, Bank of America, the Boston Foundation, and I see Paul Grogan and Mary Jo Meisner here in the front, thank you very much. The Lowell Institute, Viacom, and our media partners, the Boston Globe, well represented here tonight, Xfinity and WBUR. Tonight's forum is inspired by the latest beautiful book of photos by Bill Brett called Boston Irish. When Bill dropped by the library recently to give me a copy, in addition to sharing my own Irish credentials, despite how I look, my grandfather was born in Ireland, and the family that I married into, the Donlins and the Campions, who are 100% Boston Irish Catholic, but hail not from Dorchester, Jim and Bill, another sector in Boston, that far away place called West Roxbury. <laughs> I was quick to offer that we have an event to celebrate his book, Boston's Irish, Communi Irish Community, and to begin celebrating St. Patrick's Day early here on Columbia Point at this magnificent memorial to Boston's native son and Irish Catholic president, John F. Kennedy. I'm sure that many of you here today remember President Kennedy's very special and moving trip to Ireland, which was in the summer of 1963. What many people may not remember is that he actually first traveled to Berlin, which despite his remarkable speech at the Berlin Wall was a sobering trip for him as he saw in full view the stark contrast between the East and West. But he went right from Berlin to Ireland, which was, as Arthur Schlesinger writes about so eloquently in his book, A Thousand Days, a great release for him. He said in his book about the trip to Ireland, he had never seen the president easier, happier, and more completely than himself than on that trip to Ireland. The film footage that we have of this trip is extraordinary, and it'll soon be on full view in the new museum. But we thought we'd show you a couple short clips from that tonight. In the first one, you'll see President Kennedy's joy and laughter as he addresses the crowd in his hometown of New Ross. When uh, my great-grandfather left here to become a uh, Cooper in East Boston, he carried uh, nothing with him except two things, a strong religious faith and a strong uh, desire for liberty. If he hadn't left, I'd be working over at the Albatross Company. <laughs> or perhaps for John V. Kelly. <laughs> in, in any case, <laughs> we are happy uh, to be back here. The next clip as he's preparing to leave Ireland, his parting and very poignant words to a crowd that gathered to see him off in Limerick in this last summer of 1963. Though 
other days may not be so bright as we look towards the future, but the brightest days will continue to be those in which we visited you here in Ireland. springtime. So tonight, over 50 years later, it's so fitting that we gather at President Kennedy's library to talk about Boston's Irish, not just the old, but also the new faces of Boston. We have a panel gathered that represents the best of Boston's growing and evolving Irish community. No one here needs an introduction. <clears throat> but everyone wanted to be on this panel, so I apologize for the size of it, <laughs> but I will be brief. First, uh, on the end is Father Jack Ahern, whose Dorchester paris parishes were once dominated by Irish Catholics and are now populated by so many different nationalities. He's been described by our moderator in the globe as one of the souls of our church. Next, Senator Linda Dorsina Foray, a Haitian American, educated here in Irish Catholic schools, whose husband, Bill, and father-in-law, Ed, are also leaders in this community. <clears throat> She's also the mother of four, and who has been most recently the senator representing South Boston, and now therefore hosts the nationally renowned St. Patrick's Day breakfast in Boston. Last year was her first breakfast, and she hit it out of the park. <laughs> And Barbara Lynch, a woman who was raised in South Boston's housing projects, had her first kitchen job cooking at a local rectory, and built her career right here in Boston to become an award-winning and world-renowned restaurateur. And she just told me, actually, she cooked for Ambassador Kennedy in Tokyo on the 4th of July. <laughs> And then we have Joyce Linehan, a Dorchester native whose career has spanned, or I should say connected the arts community to Boston, um, to, to politics in a whole new way. She started out as a punk rock promoter, became a political activist, and she's a force behind several successes on the Boston political scene here, including Elizabeth Warren, Ayanna Presley, and now Marty Walsh, who brought her inside City Hall as the mayor's chief of policy. Thank you, Joyce. And then, of course, what's a Boston Irish panel without nepotism? And good stories, he promised me. <laughs> so we're lucky to have Bill's brother, Jim Brett, here, the president and CEO of the New England Council, and most importantly, a member of the board of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, a former legislator himself, Jim has done so much, not just for Boston, but for our entire region in providing a voice and extending our reach as an important economic engine in the country. <laughs> and finally, to the man to whom we owe this evening, the legendary Boston Globe photographer, Bill Brett who, I should quickly add, will be signing copies of his book, which is on sale in our museum store right after this forum. Bill's books, chronicling the great people of Boston, have done so much to tie us all together as one family. Thank you so much, Bill, for all of your books, but most recently this one. And finally, who better to corral and get the best out of this group of wallflowers than our moderator this evening, the Pulitzer Prize winning Boston Globe columnist and the best selling author of a book on Whitey Bulger, Kevin Cullen. Ke I'm not quite done. <laughs> Kevin opened the Globe's Ireland Bureau in 1997 and knows more about the Boston Irish than anyone in this town. Please join me in welcoming them all and thank you so much for this forum. Thanks, Heather. And by the way, uh, uh, all those people in West Roxby, we call them laser curtain, but we're not going to go into that. Um, you know, those clips got me thinking 
Um, when Jack Kennedy was elected President of the United States, it was a, a psychic moment for the Irish American community, if not the Irish community, um, breaking all sorts of barriers, creating all sorts of possibilities. Um, and I just would like to go right down the line and ask each one of you here what that meant to you, not necessarily at the time, because some of you weren't even alive probably when it happened, but what did Jack Kennedy being elected president of the United States mean? Father Jack? Uh, I grew up in Arlington in the projects. Irish Catholic, very proud of it. Uh, but I didn't have a sense that it had, fu had a future. I was only six years old. And when Kennedy was uh, elected, I had a sense that I could be anything. The possibilities were endless. There was, there was great hope. And I remember running to the Decatur market and getting a congratulations card. And it was you know, a boat, because I knew he liked boats, and it was a scene, ocean scene. And uh, I sent it. And about well, three months later, I got a card back from the White House. Of course, I thought he signed it personally. <laughs> thanking me for my note. Uh, only years later did my mother tell me the congratulations card actually said, get well. <laughs> Could have been worse, Father. <laughs> Joyce? Um, I think um, I'll go to a sort of dark place. I think that um, President Kennedy's assassination, um, I, I was very young when, when he died, um, really taught us a great deal about sadness and empathy. I mean, it really was a moment that was taken away from us, especially as uh, Boston Irish, um, that, that I think still lingers um, to this day. Jimmy. I was a bond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I read about him. Uh, needless to say, is, is, uh, his election, uh, even though I was just you know, a young lad, I just felt first pride, <clears throat> Irish, finally. Uh, to assume the position of president, but also um, the feeling that the world is unlimited and what you could do now. That we, I just felt that uh, he has achieved the highest office in politics, that now you can achieve anything that you want to do in life. And needless to say, his words about you know giving back, I think that's something that I'll always remember two things. One, about each person can make a difference. You don't need a title to make a difference. But also, too, that he was the first president to acknowledge, through his sister, the disability community, and hiring people with disability, recognizing people with disability, giving them an opportunity to live a life of fulfillment. But the point is that he was the first president to create that commission, and it's in existence today. So those are two things I remember. Senator. <clears throat> First, thank you for having me. Um, I would say I was not born, um, obviously, but um, you know, I would say in terms of what Jim said is that the inspiration, right, in terms of being able to lift a whole, a whole culture in terms of the Irish American and being Catholic was quite outstanding. Now, I, I know from the experience through my father-in-law, Ed Forey, who's here, um, who's, talked to, uh, you know, who's talked about that moment with me a lot in terms of what it meant you know, for the Irish here in Dorchester, in Boston. But, you know, the fact that he was Catholic and proud in terms of his religion as well was something that, um, you know, you'll never forget. So as a first-generation American, you know, I can appreciate that, of having someone who, for generations, in terms of Irish coming here in the 1800s, and the treatment, and to be able to have someone end up in becoming the President of the United States, anything's possible. And so it was quite um, an amazing feat. Mm. Bill? Uh, I, was, uh, I just gra graduated high school that year, and I was uh, taking photographs since I was 14. And in November, when the tragedy took place, I said to my mother, I said, I have to go. And she says, go where? And I said, I've got to get to Washington to photograph this funeral. Because I never had the opportunity to photograph him here, alive. And I said, I have to be part of this. So a friend of mine, George Monroe, and I, we got a credential from the Dorchester paper, and off we went to Washington. And I was there to photograph the funeral, and it was the most spectacular thing I think I've ever did. And I was, that, that was, and then coming back, I blew the engine in Connecticut. And we had a, <laughs> at a Volkswagen, we had to take a bus back, and then we had to go back to Connecticut, rebuild the engine, and at that time it was $350, which was a lot of money. 
but it was worth every bit of it and to be able to be there for that historic moment because I never really had the opportunity to photograph him alive. Barbara? <clears throat> uh, I, I wasn't born then, um, but um, you know, my mother would remind me constantly how, how great he was as a president and I'm with father. I, I mean, he, it kind of set the, the tone uh, for Irish pride, um, what well, we call it Southie pride. Um, and he, he, he did make you feel like you could accomplish anything. At least that's how I felt, coming from a housing project. Um, mm. My mother had seven kids. She basically raised us single, single parent. Um, and the funny thing is, in old harbor projects, the house I lived in was where Speaker McCormick lived as well. So we used to get all these phone calls for Speaker McCormick. Um, and then I'm going to speed up a little bit. And um, my cousin is actually a congressman, Stephen Lynch. And my uncle was the campaign ma manager for Moakley way back when, John uh, Lynch. So I love politics. I just, I love it. The fact that my first restaurant is right across from the state house is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and, and I have investors who were actually friends with Senator Kennedy, and I'd be talking to one of them on the phone, and he'd say, oh, I gotta hang up. Senator Kennedy's on the phone. And I'm like, what, am I chopped liver, you know? <laughs> um, so they, it, it's, a, it's a great family, tons of Irish pride, and I think he was a great president. Um, fair in many ways, many, many ways. Thanks. Uh, we've got a, quite a crew here tonight, if you, and just freeze this image in your mind because I believe this is the only time you will see Joyce Linehan to the right of Linda Dorsina Forey. <laughs> but <laughs> aside of that, Billy, you know, when I first heard you were going to do this project, I did not quite know where it was going to go. I didn't know what you had in mind, but I'm curious, during the whole process, did you come away from this, did you have preconceived notions about what we consider the Boston Irish community, and were they changed when that book went to press? Well, uh, the idea, uh, I, I got the idea, I was at a school in East Boston, it was two years ago, I can remember it so well. I was there to photograph one of the tennis players, and uh, I was in the, uh, the gym, and I was looking up in the ceiling, and I counted about 65 flags from 65 different countries. And as I was looking around, I said, oh my God, I said, this is unbelievable. So the headmaster came out and I asked him, I said, does this mean that there's somebody in this school that represents this flag? And he said, yes. Some were five, some were 10, some were the smaller groups, some were bigger groups. And I, at that moment, I said to, my, to myself, when I get home, I gotta say to my wife, I'm gonna discuss this with her and tell her that tomorrow I'm gonna start a project to photograph the Irish of Boston because the demographics are changing. Uh, I could see just in that, with those countries, that I wanted to capture the men and women of this, t of this town that have done some wonderful things. And as a time goes on that other colleagues of mine have passed away, I go to their homes and I visit them and I ask their survivors, uh, where are the photographs that were taken by he or she? And it, they all tell me the same story. Oh, they're in boxes in the basement or in the garage. So I didn't want my photographs to be in the garage or the basement. I wanted this to be people would remember these people. And, and as I started the project, I, I, my, by being in town so long, I'm celebrating my 50th year being photographing for the Boston Globe, that I got to know a lot of these people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, got, I was able to come up with a list in my mind First of all, I picked out, it went through my files. It took me days to go through the files of the globe and some in the basement of my home uh, of some of the men and women who passed on because I thought it'd be important to put them in. And then as I, every day, somebody would say to me, did you think about so-and-so? In the course of six months, the thing was running. I had 100 photographs, I was happy. Another six months, now it was 200 photographs. I was, I was saying, somewhere I have to stop this because all my other books all ended. I ended up with about 150 pages, 160. This one here has 308 pages, 275 photographs of black and white. And at some point, I had to stop it. And Carol Baggy, who was sitting here over tonight, she'd say to me, 
who did the writing on all my books, and uh, without her, job, it, it wouldn't be possible. Uh, she would say to me, when are you going to end this? And I said, well, I have one more, I have one more. And then eventually I had to shut, because it was getting late that the year was moving closer and the publisher couldn't handle it because the book was getting bigger and bigger. But I thought that it was important to do this, to capture this moment in time, because it won't be here in 20, 25 years, and neither will I. I hope I am, but I don't think I will. But I thought that it, when you put it all in the book, it's all in one group. And as I go through town now, I see the book in doctor's office, lawyer's office, and banks. I see it everywhere, in libraries. And I know that it's going to be there forever. And I think that is what I was trying to show, is what these men and women have done to build this, help build the city. Because when the famine struck in 1845 to 49, that a lot of these immigrants came you know, to America. And then the early 1900s, we were very fortunate because we had something that the other immigrants didn't have, the Italians, the, the, the Jews, the Polish, and the Greeks. They didn't speak English, so we had that inside track. Now, our English wasn't great, but we knew what the Brahmins and the Yankees were saying. <laughs> so we were, able, we were able to put it together that as a group, and then the Kennedys, the Kennedys and the Fitzgeralds and the Curleys looked around and they said, Jesus, a lot of us. So that's how they built their power. But the power was built with the photographs, and then as we moved through life and John Kennedy becoming the first Irish president, and then it was we move into the, the 1990s, uh, uh, the year 2005 and 2009, uh, two, actually three Irish families, uh, John Fish, who built these schools, uh, Peter Lynch and Jack Connors raised the money to rebuild nine, is it father? Nine Catholic schools? Five. Oh, nine, yeah. No, Brockton. well, between Brockton, Brockton, Boston, and South Boston, to rebuild these Catholic schools for a good formal education. And they really weren't built for the Irish because about 80% of them are, are minority and people of color. So they're building for the future. So the Irish, are, and the way the immigration law is today, that the, a lot of the Irish are going to Canada and they're going to Australia because it's a lot easier. But these men and women that I just mentioned, those particular men, are building for the future, for the future immigrants, because we are immigrants, and our job now is to help the next group of immigrants, whoever they are. So that's basically what it is. It is, tr it is true, Billy, that the Irish uh, were white and spoke English, and yet we have a mayor today who I believe is the first mayor in the history of Boston whose parents' native language was not English. That's it was right. Irish. That's right. Um, and, and I know that nationally it was portrayed when, when Marty and John Conley were the you know, finalists for the mayor a couple of years ago that it was a couple of Irish Pauls running out. And it struck me as odd, and I wanted to ask you about this, Joyce, what has changed. And I mean, Marty Walsh did better in places uh, where there were more minority voters than where there would have been the traditional Irish bloc. How did, what's changed in our culture here in Boston that that happens? Well, first of all, I just want to thank you for the astute observation you made earlier, but I'm stage left of Linda. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know stage. No, I stay in there. Sorry, he has that right. He has the um, I, I, think that, I think the mayor spoke to immigrants. Um, Frankly, he spoke to immigrants. He spoke to immigrant communities. He spoke, spoke to that progressive uh, um, uh, desire in those communities. I think that a lot of the people, a lot of the immigrants who've come to, the, um, to Boston lately see themselves in, in the mayor's story. They see themselves in the, the, the story he tells of his parents who met you know, in, in Dudley um, at one of the Irish dance halls, um, came here looking for a better life and found a better life for, for their two kids. And, and, and that, uh, we, we spoke to a lot of people who were either first or second generation who, who really understood what that meant. Um, and, and he really spoke to them on that level. But do you think that's changed? I mean, I think that Irishness in this town used to be more almost like an exclusive badge and it's true in Ireland too. It, it wasn't cool to be Ireland before Seamus Heaney, to be Irish before Seamus Heaney, you too, you name it. Things have changed internationally, but it seems like it's also changed here. That when you describe yourself, and I'll direct this to the, you know, where my family were from, where uh, people from Galway, they used to call us the Black Irish, um, which means a lot of different things, Senator. But I mean, I would argue that you are well, I'll say I am Boston Irish. Irish. <laughs> 
It had to do with the hair center. I lost that one. I know, I know it did. Um, but I, it really has changed in the idea that when I, I actually think of you as an I, I know family, were, your parents are from Haiti, but I think of you as an Irish politician. Is that wrong? No, I mean, no, it's not wrong, right? So it's really fascinating because I think all of us, right, appreciate Irish culture and actually try to emulate, you know, the, the culture itself. But I am married to an Irishman. I mean, I do have four children who are biracial. So we do celebrate Irish culture. We celebrate Asian culture, African American culture. We celebrate a lot of things in our home, right? Because that's just, <laughs> that's who we are. And so I think that if you look at the style of an Irish politician in terms of um, door knocking right here, right here, the, the master yeah. of campaigning right here, um, you know, I do that as well, right? So mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily, um, I think the Irish politicians have really perfected you know, the whole election piece and getting votes out and really mobilizing people to come out and vote. And so that's what we do as well. And so I, I would say that, you know, St. Patrick's Day is 14 days away in terms of the breakfast. And so at that point, we all are Irish. And I think what's more important is that, you know, it's the struggle. And I think Joyce said it perfectly. Because Mayor Walsh got elected because he talked to that, right? Hmm. It's not just, gener there are generations of Irish people, we know that. Folks who've been here for centuries. Right, but Marty is first generation, right? His parents just came from Ireland and he's been able to become mayor because of hard work, because of perseverance, and because of, because of knowing that this is an incredible country, that you can come from wherever you are, that you can make it here in America. It is incredible. And that's the story, I think, that resonates with people, um, whether you're Irish or not whether you're black Irish or not, really black hair Irish, no, but we're joking. <laughs> like Barbara, black hair Irish. But, you know, so, uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> and the mayor's recent trip to Ireland didn't look unlike JFK's trip to Ireland. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, the, the excitement it's for him true. over there is really um, probably even more than it was here. Well, I say the difference is that when Jack, Jack Kennedy got to Ireland, he met cousins he never heard of before. Mm -hmm. When Marty went there, he went met cousins he played with when he was a little boy. It's true. Very it's different. True. Jimmy, you've seen it all. Uh, and <laughs> I was, you know, picking up what the senator was talking about, how, how does that play out differently in the neighborhoods? I mean, I guess 30 years ago, an Irish Paul could get elected with just the Irish vote. That's really changed. Yeah, it has changed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, not to, not to dwell on on Marty again, but an Irish uh, candidate in Boston um, can do very well throughout the city, and obviously you have to to be elected, and that's what happened in this this past uh, mayor's election. Marty turned out to be a a rainbow candidate. Uh, we had Mel King in '83 being the rainbow candidate. Uh, Marty uh, became the rainbow candidate by campaigning across the city. This city has changed dramatically in many, many ways and all positive. Uh, we have new, new people moved in, moving into the city uh, that uh, um, may not have children. They're professional people. They're interested in you know, what's going on downtown. Then you have other people who have families and they're interested in the schools, whatever. Um, a politician needs to address all of that but an Irish politician, uh, I, I think, uh, can do it and do it in a very effective way. And uh, we've seen it. So uh, the city has changed. But to be Irish, I think, is, uh, you know, it's almost like, so what? What else is there that you have to offer to me? You don't run basically saying I'm Irish or I'm Catholic. Uh, tell me what you believe in and the education. Tell me what you believe in and how you move the economy. What are you going to do about crime in the neighborhood? But, so, Jack, um, you are part of that. I think it's one of my favorite f photos in the book. It's you and Doc, uh, Doc Conway, who's a, a, a priest in Dorchester, and, and um, Dan Finn, another priest. And the three of you there, as I said, Dan was born in Ireland. You and Doc might as well have been. Uh, and yet, you guys represent a flock that has changed so dramatically um, Doc actually learned how to speak Portuguese so he could talk to all those Cape Verdean kids, and they love him. And I, I, if you could walk us through there, that how those parishes in Dorchester that were once Irish 
are sort of Irish in ethos, but not Irish in presence anymore. Yeah. I have, uh, my three parishes, uh, five different languages. I only speak English, but I smile on all five. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah, and, and the dreams they have are no different from the dreams my parents have. I mean, I see, you know, Cape Verdeans doing two, three f jobs, if they can get the jobs. Work hard, work hard, work hard. You know, pushing the kids off to school. Um, and so in many ways, they, they arrive knowing that things are possible. They come from difficult situations in many cases. And if they, if they work hard, uh, they sacrifice, their kids are gonna do well. And it's no different from my parents. I mean, I looked at the Rooney picture and I almost cried because it was my parents. I mean, the, the Rooneys are holding a picture from a, a previous book of 11 boys. My parents went as Catholic, we only had seven. Um, <laughs> but, you know, my father worked three jobs, my mother worked so we could be uh, as successful as we could as an adult. And that's true with the, the Hispanics, the Cape Verdeans, the New Polish, and, and the Vietnamese. It's just, it's, it's, it's great to see, mm. you know? Barbara, I'm wondering about, I mean, you represent a sort of a, a, the, the great modern Boston Irish woman. I mean, if you went back 40 years ago, maybe even less, I don't know how many Boston Irish women entrepreneurs there were in this town. And you are sort of out there. People know, I always say the a level of, uh, you know you've reached middle age or maturity that when I was a young man in, living in South Boston, I went to your brother's place, the quiet man. And as I got older and smarter and a little more money in my pocket, I went to your restaurants. <laughs> um, but talk about that. I mean, you, as you said, I mean, you're, you're a success story at so many different levels, coming out of the project, coming out of a culture that wasn't pushing women to open businesses on their own. Talk about that. And, uh, I mean, I come from I, I, an amazing amount, 40 years is crazy. Um, I, I lived right next to Billy Bulger, Whitey Bulger, I mean, Whitey lived with his mother. I don't know who that is, but go okay. on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my mother, you know, we worked. She had us working. I mean, we were shoveling the tea during snowstorms. Uh, we're still doing it, we're still doing it. Still doing it. <laughs> and, uh, the main thing was treat people the way you want to be treated, and that's always stuck with me. And I did work in a rectory. That was my first cooking job. I was like 14, and Father Quinn would say, now, Barbara, do you think you're ever going to come to Mass? <laughs> and I'd say, no, I, don't, I, don't, you know, I really don't think so, but uh, I'm fine right here. Um, and uh, cooking, God, I mean, basil was exotic in South Boston. <laughs> So that was unheard of. Um, and in even the fact that I wanted to cook, my mother just thought I was crazy because I had a, I had a great job down on the, um, on the waterfront. I actually worked in a warehouse down on, uh, it, it used to be called Port Terminals. And, uh, and I had insurance. And so, and so when, when I decided to cook, she said, God, we, well, what are you going to do about insurance? You're going to be working at a McDonald's. And, I said, no, Ma, I just wanna, I wanna cook. And, uh, and then that was it. I, she would always claim that I was trying to kill her with provolone cheese instead of <laughs> the Land O'Lakes sliced on number four. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, and then I went through the whole forced busing era. So I never graduated high school. I never went to college. Um, I just knew that if I could cook, I'd always have a job for the rest of my life. And, um, and then that was it. I, I always thought I'd have a s s sub shop, Spuckies we Spuckies call them. Spuckies, yeah. <laughs> Steak tips and yeah. Spuckies. And, um, so I'm, I'm a lot farther than that. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Barbara, talking about your mom reminds me of my mother who was uh, the child of immigrants from Galway. And, first graduating class of Gate of Heaven in 1938, and obviously South Boston's the only place where Gate of Heaven would be reduced to Gatey. And um, when I told her I had been hired after working in a small newspaper that I was coming back to Boston, 
She said, that's nice. Do you know there's a fireman's exam on Saturday? <laughs> Mom was right. I actually should have. <laughs> anyway, um, Bill, I, actually, talking about Irish mothers, I would love you to talk about your mom, Marianne, and sort of she came over here, started a family, and then she, if you follow that trajectory, that continuum, we come to this book. So talk a little about her. Well, uh, my mother, uh, Jim actually knew my mother too. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> very close yeah. nine Jim was very close to my mother for nine months. Uh, I, I thought that the, uh, my mother was a, a super person. I mean, she was, she, she was it in our family. Uh, my dad worked hard, but they drank, they worked, they worked, they drank, they went to sleep. And my mother would uh, do everything else. Uh, she worked, she raised six children. My oldest brother was, uh, was handicapped and uh, who demanded a lot of time and she gave him all the time that, she, that he needed. She worked scrubbing floors uh, between 11 o'clock and 6.30 in the morning at Bank of, at that time it was Bank of, Bank of Boston. And she'd come home and get everybody ready off to school. And I don't, I don't remember my mother ever sleeping. I don't know how she did it. Uh, and you know, when I said to her that I'd be out taking photographs at 14 and 15, I'd be out chasing fires. And my mother would always say, well, where are you? What are you doing? And I said, well, I'm gonna tr I want to be a photographer. And my mother used to say photographer. And she said, what is that? I said, I'm going to take photographs. I want to, I want to, make, I want to make some money. And uh, so I was 16 and 17, and uh, I, I, I met this friend of mine, David Muga, who had a car, and uh, he had a camera, and uh, him and I struck up a, a conversation, and every Saturday night he'd pick me up, because he was a student at Babson at the time, and we'd pick up the late Arthur Fiedler at the side door at Symphony Hall, and we'd drive around all night, four or five o'clock in the morning, and we'd shoot photographs of anything that happened. And I'd come in at five o'clock in the morning, and my mother would say, where have you been all night? I says, Ma, you wouldn't believe what I saw. Five alarms in Roxbury, West Roxbury. I says, we went to Lynn, Chelsea all night. And we were probably starting those. Probably. <laughs> and, she used, and she used to say to me, well, as long as, just be careful. That's all she would say, be careful. And she never asked for anything. And in her later years in life, I mean, life, I mean, when she never talked about Ireland, uh, the only person that really got information out of it was my oldest sister, who's over there, yeah. Peggy. Uh, we she do, was. We, we do have uh, two sisters. We have two sisters, yes, Peggy and Mary, yes, and uh, they seem to get more. But she she <laughs> continued life that she was just a super. I mean, I, I can't say enough about her because uh, she meant so much to me. And uh, this particular book I dedicated to her because uh, my sister Peggy was able to give me some information about her that Jim and I didn't know anything about because the old Irish they didn't say very much, and their life. And she told me that. You know, she left Ireland in a matter of a couple of days. Uh, by, she had four brothers, and uh, she was told it was time to get out because things weren't good. Uh, one of her brothers was in the IRA, and uh, she was helping her brother, and they found out she had a good... Next day, she was on a boat to America, and she didn't see them again for 50 years. Hmm. And, I mean, it was... And she never talked about anything in life. And then when Jim ran for state representative, uh, she uh, died uh, four days before. She, uh, she, had, she had a stroke. And my older brother was with her, Jack, and he, she was on the floor for several hours. And he put a pillow underneath because he didn't know how to do it. It was called 911. And he thought she was just asleep. And when Jim came home, he found her in the next day. It was, it was a sad moment. But she was so proud to work for Jim. And she'd say, like Marty's mother was doing the same thing. Don't vote for my son. He's running for office and he needs your vote. And I can remember my mother was doing commercials on the Irish Hour. And <laughs> she only went to, I think, the third grade. And she was in there pumping those votes. And uh, it was just, they were Irish mothers. I'm sure every, a lot of people here can relate to them. They were all poor. They didn't know they were poor. Uh, there was, in my family, neither one of my parents drove a car. We didn't have a car. But we were all in the same boat. So no one knew. We were, all, we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor. But we were poor in different ways, but we were rich in better ways. And that's why, on, on this particular book, uh, I thought it was appropriate for me to dedicate it to my mom.
Joyce, in your lifetime, um, I'm wondering if you, I mean, your identity would be Irish, right? You would identify yourself. I mean, it's a thing peculiar about this town. I think people never use the hyphens and put the American after. They tend to say they're Irish, they're Polish, they're Lithuanian, they're Haitian, they're, you name it. Um, how has the definition or your self-identity changed in your lifetime, or has it? Uh, it's changed a lot, actually. I, I came to my Irishness pretty late in life. I'm half Irish. My father was Irish. My mother was French-Canadian. Oh, yep, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, she grew up as an olive-skinned person on King Street in Dorchester, and uh, according to her, suffered for it. My father died when I was four. So she was a single mom raising three kids, and we lost touch with my father's side of the family, didn't, didn't reconnect with them until I was pretty much an adult. Um, and I was also I was into sort of edgy art and music and things like that, so sort of an outcast. Um, I, I think that the insularity of, I, of Irish Bostonians was probably a little bit more pronounced in the late 70s and early 80s than it is now, and, um, and it, it was a little bit tough, so, so very much an outsider. It wasn't until, um, so Michael Patrick McDonald is a very close mm -hmm. friend of mine, um, mm -hmm. and he and I had very much the same experience, and it wasn't until we sort of looked to Ireland for our Irishness that we really got to understand what it was all about, that the, the, the closeness to the country itself um, uh, and the art that exists there um, really was a very, very different experience. Um, I think that later generation Irish in Boston, at least as kids in that era, um, it, it was tough. If you were anything other than what, if you were anything other than them, it was a little bit difficult to navigate. So, um, so, so much later, after I'd you know, gone to college, had a career, gotten involved in music, traveled the world, traveled to Ireland with different bands, um, uh, it, it, that's when I sort of got in touch with my Irishness. And now I'm very, very, very happy to be an Irish American. But, but what you're saying is that you found it more in Ireland than you found in absolutely. here, the capital of Irish America. It's, it's true. It's absolutely true. I mean, yeah. uh, let, Let's face it. Let's let's put it out there. I mean, there, there's definitely an element of um, of uh, racism and bigotry that existed in the 70s and 80s in in, in Boston um, amongst Irish and other other groups of people as well. Um, and I grew up in St. Brendan's, which is a very, very white neighborhood. Um, didn't really know that there were anything other than Irish Catholics until I was probably 13 or 14. Um, but when I discovered that there was more out there, I was very, very interested in it. So, so you know, went out, learned those things, um, you know, really got involved. Music was really my door to the world. Mm -hmm. Music and theater, really my door to the world. Um, and that, it, it took me kind of going out and exploring those things, among them Irish arts, to really come back and appreciate what I had here. And things are different now, um, you know, very, very different. I find that uh, um, uh, the Irish, um, especially the ones who have not been here as long, uh, they're, they're much more in touch with their, uh, let's, well, let's say, say an, an oppressed people um, mm. uh, really has a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion. And, and I think that, that over the years, um, that's become more apparent in, in Boston Irish than it perhaps was in the late 70s and early 80s. By the way, you know what we call French Canadians who marry Irishmen? Social climbers. <laughs> well, George Keneally introduced my mother to my father, so oh, there it's you all go. his oh, fault. The great George. Um, I actually use this anecdote in Billy's book in the intro, and uh, it, it revolves around when Bruce Bowling was elected the first African American president of the Boston City Council, there was a reception for him up at the Parkman House, and he had punished somebody who had voted against him. And I went up to him, I said, Jesus, Bruce, a brother finally gets a job, and the first thing you do is act like an Irish Paul. <laughs> and he slid his arm around my shoulder, and he said, Kevin, in this town, we're all Irish by osmosis. <laughs> Senator, is that true? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Oh, come on. Now, I know the Irish knows how to hold a grudge, though, so we need to work on that. We need to work on that. <laughs> no, I don't hold grudges, no. No, but I mean, I it is, when you think about it in the context since the, you know, the mid-19th century, or certainly towards the end of the 19th century and on, the Irish were the dominant culture here. Now, there are bad things that come with it. There are some good things with it, um, it like everybody else. But I'm saying, 
ask, I'm asking you, what have other cultures in Boston taken from the Irish, for better or worse? Okay, I will say that, um, you know, to piggyback on Joyce, I think, you know, the 70s, obviously, early, you know, early 70s with busing, that was a negative experience, no doubt about it. I would say I'm now the state senator for the first Suffolk, which has South Boston, which is an incredible community. I think outside of Massachusetts, out in other states around our country, people still look at Boston as the Boston of the 70s. You know, so they're like, wow, there's black people in Boston? Or, wow, how is it over there? Isn't it racial? And it's really not. I mean, Boston is an incredible community. It's people who are experiencing various things like we're experiencing in Dorchester, from lack of housing, transportation, jobs. It's the same issues. And I would say that when I first ran for Senate, and this is an interesting example, I was on a black radio show. And um, I was driving there, but I'm also listening. So on the radio, people were like, well, why does she want to host a breakfast? You know, she shouldn't even host the St. Patrick's Day breakfast because of all the racial issues that happen. And so as I got into the station, um, into the radio station, and I put on my microphone, and, you know, I'm listening, and, I'm ta and a woman calls in from Mattapan. And she says, well, Linda, you know, Senator, I'm so happy you're running. I have to tell you my experience. I am a black woman from Mattapan, but before busing, my parents would go to South Boston and they would go clamming on the beaches on Southie. And they would be, and I said to her, really? Right, I'm born in 1973, okay? And so I'm like, okay, so tell me about it. She's like, yeah, black families were in Southie all the time. I said, were there other white families on the beach? She said, yes, they were there as well. So white families were on the beach, black families were on the beach. We were clamming together and they would go by, back home. Was there any racial issue? She said, no, I never experienced any racial issue until busing came. And so I think when you pit, you know, when there's poor white families and poor black families, and it becomes that dynamic of, you know, you're taking from me or you're taking from mine. Um, so I say that because that was quite an eye-opening experience for me. As someone who grew up born and raised in Dorchester, have read and seen all the stories around our busing issues that happen here, and to have this woman talk about her experience that, you know, I was in Southie with my family and a rock never came towards us or our rock window, uh, you know, our window was never broken. But I could also give you another story of my father who drove through Southie with my younger brother and my younger sister and it was during busing. He's a Haitian immigrant and like a lot of stories here, working like Father Jack, working two or three jobs and I see former Representative Marie St. Fleur here in the back, um, a good colleague, same experience where our parents are working hard, it's the same exact Irish experience. Working two or three jobs, just want to put food on the table, keep a roof over their children's head. And my father took a wrong turn and he took a wrong turn in Southie and a rock came through his window, right? But he didn't know. But he knew, wow, I need to get to 64 Howard Avenue, right? I need to get back home um, to where I know where I am. And so that's what he did. But we've had incredible, um, growing up, we've had incredible role models. So I'll say Father Jack O'Hearn is quite an amazing priest. But, um, you know, so Father Jack is doing an incredible job. And before Father Jack, there was Father Bill Francis, who was my pastor who baptized me, who married me, who counseled us. And with Marie, right, Marie at St. Paul's Church, Holy Family Parish, loved Father Francis, was intertwined in my family, was knee deep in the issues around my family and my brothers and my siblings and all of us in our neighborhoods. Was he there. was an Irish man. I was there to photograph he, That's right, at wedding. my wedding. <laughs> and then, you know, but he learned how to speak Spanish because he did his missionary work in Peru. And he was there for 10 years. And when he came to St. Paul's Parish, it wasn't an all-black church, but it was diverse, where there was a large Irish community, but there were the Haitians that were there, right? There were other communities that were coming in. There was the large Spanish community, and he was conducting mass in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so for me, growing up with the Irish, yes, I'm married to the Fourries now, but I knew the Irish before the Fourries, right? <laughs> Bill Francis, Father Bill Francis introduced me to this um, incredible, incredible culture of laughter and of like just quick wit, right? He was very quick, <laughs> very quick. Um, no, but it's really an incredible experience. I mean, I'm blessed, right? Blessed to sit in this position, blessed to be able to bring people to the table, whether you're from Southie, Mattapan, Dorchester, or High Park, we are in it together. That the struggles of your families and your, the generations past 
is the struggles that immigrants are dealing with now. And so it's really creating that balance and really seeing ourselves in people that are sitting in front of us. They may not look like us, right? They may not look like me. They may not look like, like you and like you. But it's the common experience. And I think Barbara said it best, that you treat people the way you want to be treated. And you speak to people the way you want to be spoken to. I am born and raised Catholic. My Catholic faith has really um, solidified my experience. And how do you treat people the way you want to be treated? And that is critical. And it's something you can do every day, right? It's not something grand. It's just smile, like Father Jack said. You smile, and you acknowledge someone that's walking next to you. It's that simple. And I think, you know. Hmm. Smile, but keep the grudges. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't keep the grudges. Let the grudges fade. Let the grudges fade. <laughs> Barbara, do you cringe at all when, when people, the term Boston Irish, when, when put in that context back in the 70s, I think it was associated with negativity, that there was sort of this, you know, that rightly or wrongly, people said, oh, the Irish in Boston didn't want this. Do you cringe when you hear that? Because some people think that. We were integrated. I had so many black friends. And when forced busing started, um, my mother was one of the mothers who just went motorcading every day. Was she in Roar? Judge Garrity. Hmm? Was she in Roar, your mother? Was she, was she a member of Roar, the anti-busing? She group? wasn't a member of Roar, but she, she hmm. was just one of the parents that didn't want to see their kids shuffled off to the, to the other side of town. So I ended up in uh, uh, Madison Park High. And um, it, it, she couldn't afford to keep me in uh, parochial school. It, so, so Boston changed. Mm. Um, and Boston in general, I, don't, I wouldn't just say Southie. I mean, we, Boston was just not the place she wanted to be. Um, so fighting every day at school. Uh, and then the projects just became uh, worse. Mm. And drugs and, you know, so... It's been crazy just the way it, it's actually changed. And now I'm, I'm amazed, I'm blessed um, to be where I am, to be able to give back. And I love meeting people who went to Madison Park High when I went to Madison Park High. And, um, and how we're all giving back, like Jack Connors, like you guys, everyone, Tommy Hines is out there. I mean, you know, we, we give back. You, you go through these uh, years and then all of a sudden it's like, shit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's about time somebody sweared. We got all these Irish people. Uh, frankly, I, I thought it would be to. me. I but, tried not to. It's Lent. <laughs> um, oh, it's Lent. <laughs> Jimmy, I ask you as sort of the, are you the dean of something here? I don't know. But I'll ask you, uh, it, Billy and I talked about this before in sort of the context of Bill's book, um, that given their history in this town, that the Irish have an obligation. Uh, they came here and they were not welcomed. Mm -hmm. uh, and by sheer dint of hard work and um, stick to itness, they were able to rise above that and become the dominant culture. With that, does there come an obligation for the established Irish, whether they live in Dorchester or on the Irish Riviera or on the South Shore? Do they have an obligation to reach out to the newest immigrants? Uh, I, I believe they do. And uh, f f at least for, for Bill and my family, um, it began with our mother, who said that, um, you know, we have a, a disabled uh, brother. Your job is to protect him, watch over him, and also be close to each other do that, and she also said that you also have to find time to help other people, that your world is not just taking care of yourself, that you have to reach out and help other people along the way. And I'll never forget that. And um, I think it's part of our religion, too, being brought up as Catholics, to say, 
uh, in practice, that you really are your brother's keeper. You have to be out there helping people, whether it's a smile, or a charity, or a contribution, or your time. And to me, that's what this whole journey in, in, in life is about, is giving back. It's not how much I've accumulated. It, quite frankly, I'm more interested in how much somebody's giving, rather how much they've accumulated. Uh, if I could tell you one quick, quick story. When I was a young lad going to college in Washington, I had no money. Bill already alluded to our family situation wasn't great. I happened to be selling newspapers, uh, the old record American. And uh, one of my customers was Speaker of the House, John W. McCormick. And uh, Billy always got the tip. I delivered the papers. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, he lived in Columbia Road. He had no children. Uh, it was just him and his wife, Harriet. And once a month, he'd come home, and he would, he would pay the, uh, for the papers. And he'd tell me all the wonderful things that he was doing you know, in Washington. So fast forward, I'm going to Washington. I write him a letter because my mother's upset that I'm going to Washington. I'm going to take out all these loans, and she's all very, very upset. I write a letter to the congressman saying that I'm in Washington. I'm looking for help. Maybe you can give me some help and suggestion to work my way through college. Within a week, I still have it at home. A telegram arrives at the, at the dorm. There's five of us in the dorm. I'm so happy my paper boy is, is going to college. The speaker never went to college, went to night school. I want to see you. Now today, that person who I was supposed to see, if he, if he was in existence today, they'd have the cuffs on him, because his name was John Monaghan, patronage secretary. <laughs> so they wanted to see me. So I go, to see this, I go and see the speaker, and I'll never forget, he has this blue pinstripe suit on, he's smoking a cigar, and he's way down the end of the, the room. And he said, Jimmy, come on in here. And I sat there, and I'm shaking. And he says, I have a job for you. I said, oh my gosh, I'm here for advice, guidance, a job. You're going to deliver the mail to the different congressmen, the Longworth, Cannon, and, and uh, the Rayburn building. I said, oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. Bottom line is, I'm sitting there, and I'm saying to the speaker, I don't know how to thank you. I said, my mother has no money. My brother Bill has all the money. But I said, we have no, no money, we're not politically active, and here you are giving me a job, I don't know how to thank you. And he's puffing his cigar, and he doesn't even look at me, he looks down, and he says, Jimmy, you want to thank me? Help somebody else along the way who can't repay you. I'll never forget it. In other words, you have an obligation, pass it on. You don't keep it. Enough of what I think. Um, this is the best part of the night, I think. We're going to open it up to questions on the floor. We've got uh, two microphones here on either aisle here. So come on up. And um, I'll just forewarn you, these are questions that must have a question mark on the end of them. The Irish are prone to making statements. There will be no statements. Blue, uh, oh, I don't know. And I'm brutal. Can you believe how much? So, please, come on up and ask away. You've got a great panel here. How many hits and Twitter? I mean. Father loves to answer questions. Peggy, do you have a question? <laughs> Peggy, do you have a question? <laughs> why would you? Why not? Peggy, Peggy, Peggy so Brett, do you have a question? The first person gets a free book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the first person gets a free book. I heard that. So. <laughs> it's called an oral contract. Get up. I'm Can I just have a show of hands? How many people are in the book? Yeah, the Irish are so shy. <laughs> oh, that's shy, good. So this is How many people in the book? Okay. There you go. There you go. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Now we can. So, uh, you know, when we hear of Irish in Boston, in Boston Irish, let me ask the question, is uh, East Boston a part of uh, Boston? Yes. Yes, it is. And yes, it tell, is. tell me about the Irish in East Boston, please. That's where old Joe Kennedy. That's where old Joe Kennedy. That's where he uh, began. And East, uh, East Boston had it. He uh, actually was half Irish and half Italian. And uh, in my book, there's a picture of a gentleman in there who's a retired judge that uh, 
he was responsible for starting the uh, Javali football team. And uh, he brought up, I think he has nine children from East Boston. And Ed King, uh, the former governor, grew up actually Winthrop. He was East Boston and he went to Winthrop. That's like growing up in Dorchester, going to Milton. You know, you're going up the sale. <laughs> Uh, but East Boston, uh, now today, it's not half Irish, not half Italian. And that's where I got that, uh, I, I was inspired by doing the book because when I was in that school in East Boston, the Amana school, when I saw all those flags. But these, uh, there's an expression in this, not to change the subject, but in Boston growing up, people would say, what parish are you from? Mm -hmm. And that was an identity. Well, we've changed that now with this new book. The new slogan is, what page you want? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, I'm Ed McGowan. My father grew up on Mission Hill, and he moved to it's Irish Valhalla in Lace Curtain, West Roxbury. <laughs> but they also had another neighborhood with the less well-off people lived called Leaky Roof. We have that now. And they actually, until recently, held annual reunions. And where was Leaky Roof? Down the backside, towards. Backside. Uh, well, from, back. from the Mission Church, looking oh, over the hill. Okay, I never heard back that. Back and down. Yep. I never heard that term "leaky roof" until the last two weeks. <laughs> wow, well, and I'm one of them. <laughs> anyway, my question is: Don't you think it'd be appropriate if we noted uh, JFK was the beginning of the uh, the greatest generation to serve as a president? We can't count Eisenhower. He didn't have the boots on the ground. I think it's worthy of noting. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, no. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, oh. I, oh. Uh, <laughs> question. I'm a, I'm a Dorchester guy who happens to be related to one of the people up here. And my first I'm question me. is, question. tell us about my grandchildren, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> They're fine. They're fine. Billy, <laughs> you, you have, what, 260, 275 photos? 265, yes. What's your favorite, and what's your favorite story from, from, from that show? From that uh, actually, uh, my, I, I have, I mean, they're all, I mean, I'm very proud of all the photographs, but if I had to go to the top list, uh, I would put my top photograph of uh, Mr. O'Neill, who's sitting here with his lovely daughter, that uh, when I met him and I was told about him, that uh, he and his wife uh, came from Ireland uh, 25 years ago, and they weren't blessed with children. And over the years, they explored about adopting, a ch adopting it through it, looking for adoptions. And they ended up, uh, they, they, they were in Ireland, they were in different parts of the country looking to adopt a child. And uh, they ended up adopting a little girl from Ethiopia, a little boy from Ethiopia. And they found out that the boy had three sisters in another orphanage. And he and his wife adopted the four children. And I thought, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> and when I went out to, uh, to meet him, uh, to photograph them out in Brookline, I was so inspired by these four beautiful children. And I was thinking to myself, I mean, 20, 25 years ago, an Irish family, if they brought four children that looked like them, they'd say, oh my God. Because only in those days, 25 years ago, if you were able to, Tom Flatley was one that I knew that was blessed with several uh, adopted children. They were from Ireland. But this man here adopted these children from another country to give them an opportunity to have a great life and he didn't ask them, you know, what country we're supposed to look at ourselves and say we're adopting children, not from where they're from or where they came or what church they went from. So that is my favorite photograph in the book because when I went out to photograph him with his children, I, I highlighted his children first, and I put he and his wife and, and he and his wife in the background. And I just thought that that moment when I left him and I, I was so moved by I have four children, and uh, I had several foster children during a time that my wife thought it was a good idea to, uh, to bring these kids in on an emergency program that we were involved in many years ago. And, and, but we only had them for a short time. And this man here, he and his wife, I mean, made a commitment to adopt these children all at once. And, you know, I've heard of people having twins, which I had twins. I was blessed with twins, triplets. But he had four of them. And the picture was just a beautiful picture. And it was... And, it was one that I, that I never expected to make because I never knew anything about it until this man, Pat Kelly, told me about this, this, this couple. And then I went on to uh, another photograph uh, over in Charlestown, the, the fire department chaplain, uh, 52, 51 years of, of being the chaplain for the Boston Fire Department. And when I spoke to him, 
he knew every person that he gave the last rites to by name. I mean, it was just a moving, and when I brought him to the fire academy over in Long Island to make this picture, I just thought it was just a, you know, a beautiful, beautiful moment. And the funeral picture of Larry Reynolds was one of the most finest pictures. Larry Reynolds was a great musician. He was a carpenter by profession, the father of nine children. And he, his whole life was to music, to teach people and to play the Irish songs and clubs and bars and private homes, to bring people together. And his funeral was one of the most beautiful funerals that I've ever seen because all his buddies came and they all played from one last song as he was going out the door of the church. All different instruments, young and old, come to see him. And I just thought they were very moving moments for me to see this and I was able to capture this in a photograph because a man like him should be always remembered. Uh, I talked to this wife, Phyllis, the other day and she said she saw me on TV on Chronicle and she started to cry. She said, what you said about my husband was all true. I mean, it was just a beautiful, she's just a beautiful woman. So, I mean, I was able to capture these moments of, of individuals and as I said that earlier, that it's important that it's all in the book, that it's, it'll be here for history because the next history group will be of some other group, which I hope I'm able to do the next group. And I think that, you know, by tying them all together, it really makes it a complete package. And for me, it was a gift to the city and a gift to, to the Irish community because, you know, my parents, you know, came here with really nothing. And here I am, I'm producing a book that people are going to buy. I mean, we're only in America. <laughs> and, uh, and I thank you. Bill, you remember, I was just a teenager when I met you, and, and we were covering the, the riots of those Boston summers. And you and I driving around, we used to talk, we used to joke about the fact that the, the blacks hated us because we were white, the whites hated us because we were from the globe, and the cops hated us because we were reporters. So we were the only ones at the riots without a friend. It's and true. So, so it's true, as you and I remember those moments. So my question is, is how can we bury that heritage for Boston? because that is ancient history. And I'm just wondering, I'd like to challenge this panel to maybe think about how we can somehow put those scars behind us, because this city is well beyond that at this point. Thank you, it's a good question, Tom. I think personally, since uh, I lived it, I worked it, they hated us because they didn't like the Globe stand, and uh, these were neighbors of mine that, uh, it was a tough time to be taking photographs at South Boston every day I was there. and. To bury it, I think, uh, to answer that question, I think it's been buried. Because we're a better, I mean, as we get older, uh, time marches on. Judge Garrity says it didn't work. Uh, and actually, the Globe and an editorial said it shouldn't, really, we shouldn't have done it like that. And if I, if I was the person on busing, when they implemented busing, they started it from the top. They should have started from the bottom. Because when kids go to school, three and four year old children, there's no color barrier. But when you started when you were 16 and you live on this side of the street and you're poor and you're white and this side you're black and someone's trying to steal something from you, they didn't know what, they were, what was going to be stolen from them. But I think that we, we really have come a long way that very few people you know, seem to remember or uh, talk about it. But South Boston has changed tremendously. All the new people, I say the new people, they're the generation, their parents lived there, grandparents. I mean, I have a son living in South Boston. It's they all wanted to go back to where the roots were. And I think that we've learned a lot about ourselves. Education is something that you can't buy. It's something that you really have to work at. And time takes, takes it heals a lot of wounds. And there's, there's, there's an old expression, the older you get, you know, the more wisdom that you get, and there's a lot of truth to that. And I, I personally, I, you know, when I think of South Boston today, I try not to think about, you know, during that era because it wasn't a really a nice time. But I look at it today as, as, a, great, as a great town. I don't think you can bury it. I think you learn from it. Yeah, um, that's right. It yeah. didn't work. And, you know, I, I, I see it two ways. I actually, uh, I'm a chef now because I had a wonderful home ec program at Madison Park High. I'm not sure I would have had that at Southie High had I gone to Southie High. But I also feel that when you're forced to do something by the government like that, it just doesn't work. And when you take neighborhoods where you're, you're parents come, they immigrate over here, they choose a neighborhood to live in, and they want to take your seven kids and just put them across town, I mean, I mean it just didn't make any sense. Yeah, it it no really sense. didn't make any sense. 
and you learn from that. And then the cops and, and, and you know, now it is a different city. We yeah. work together. And I think you saw that with the, with the Boston bombing. And mm. um, God, I never saw state stadies and Boston police work together. Every hospital in the city came mm. together. It was, it's, it's tremendous. And so it does make you stronger, but you shouldn't have to bury it. I, 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 it just makes us stronger as a city in, in general. And when you say that Boston has, you know, have become much better since those days, the 70s, I think politically, I look at people like Ralph Martin, African American, really a New Yorker, comes here, runs for district attorney in the 90s, runs against an Irish Catholic. Guess what? South Boston, 1990s, mm -hmm. endorses mm -hmm. with the vote Ralph Martin. I believe West Roxbury did too. Ralph Martin gets elected as the district attorney. City councilor, a person of color, tops the ticket right now, tops the ticket. Deval Patrick runs for governor in the primary against an Irish Catholic. Boston votes majority Deval Patrick. So I think Boston's come a long way in a very positive way. And I will just say, and I agree we've come a long way. And I think that you know, discussions are important in terms of remembering is critical. Mm -hmm. right? Remembering our history is important and how do we move forward. Now, are we in a post-racial society? Absolutely not. And I don't think it's just looking at South Boston as a community because of the busing. I think it's looking at all our communities and looking whether it's in housing, whether it's in business, whether it's at the boardroom, right? Is there diversity? And I think that is where the true conversation begins, that when we are in an environment where it's just homogeneous and yet there are amazing talent like women who are entrepreneurs and yet they're not on the ta at the table, you know, or there are people of color that are doing incredible things here in Boston and in Massachusetts, but they're not at the table, then we still have work to do. <laughs> and I can tell you that working with our incredible unions here in the city of Boston and in the Commonwealth, one of the things we started is doing open houses at union halls, starting right in my neighborhood. We started at the plumbers. We, this morning we were at the New England Regional Council of Carpenters saying it is important to open up these halls, to allow people to understand, you know, that this is a place for jobs, this is a place for opportunity. You know, we just celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, and he believed in the union struggle. He believed in unions because that allowed families to lift themselves out of poverty. It allowed families to get a good paying jobs and put their kids through school. So that's part of the process that we're working on now. Mayor Walsh is a leader in that. And how do we open up our union halls and bring diversity in? But we need that all over the place, not just in construction, but in our businesses all around the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And these incredible developments that's happening right here on the South Boston waterfront in my district, where we're talking about access and opportunity. Not just boots on the ground, but we have small businesses like Barbara Lynch, you know, maybe she'll open a restaurant on the waterfront, right? We have incredible small businesses, women and people of color, and veterans, whether it's accountant, engineering. I mean, this is what we need to move towards, is really saying if we are about oh, taking a holistic approach and saying that we are one commonwealth and we're in it together, then it's not saying we're burying the hatchet, because we can never bury the hatchet. But dialogue is important. We can't run away from dialogue. When things are happening around the country, we can't run away from it and say it's just happening there. Because it could happen here too. And that's how we're going to be able to transform, truly transform Boston, truly transform this incredible state that we live in. Sure. Senator, that was very, very well said. Um, I just have a question for Bill. You have published some incredible books that have had some profound impacts on the city of Boston. What is, if you, what is the impact that you want to see this book have? And how, are you there or do you feel it? Or where do you see that? What is that impact that you hope to achieve with this book? Well, uh, it's a showcase. Thank, uh, thank you for the question. It's a showcase. And I was trying to, uh, as I said earlier, to put these men and women together. Uh, to show what they have done to make, to help make Boston what it is today. And to achieve it, I thought it was, to put it together, 
uh, it could go, I could have five volumes to do this, but to do it in one book, and it took me two years to do it, it was important that, uh, for me personally, uh, to, to, to do this, because I think what it does, when other people, younger people, or other, you know, Irish immigrants, or other immigrants look at this, look at these photographs and read about what these men and women have done. Well, if they can do it, so can't we. So I think with the new, the new Boston, the new immigrants that are coming, as I said, that the Irish aren't coming the way they used to come here. We have to open up uh, to the to the new world, and whatever country it is, it's probably South Americans. Seems to be a lot coming from that area. That uh, for they look at this and they're going to say. They were a group of immigrants that, geez, they did pretty well. Well, if we work hard, we could do well, too. And this is what I'm trying to show, that, and that these men and women are ready to help the next group of immigrants. Yes, sir. Last yes, question. Sir. Um, <clears throat> Father Jack, uh, we've heard um, Bill and Jim talk about uh, their mother and the lessons learned. Could you tell this audience what they've done at, uh, in your parishes with uh, the, the food bank that's been uh, named in her honor? Yeah, when I arrived at St. Margaret's, we had a small food pantry. We served about 20, maybe 20 families a month on a good month. Uh, with the Bretts' support, and we named it after their mother, we we're up to over about 550 families a month. It's a great legacy, and it's the, it's, other than the senator's breakfast, it's the only great tradition in town around St. Patrick's Day, and that's the fundraiser for the food pantry up there. Listen, there was a quintessential Irish barman in this town named John Foley, and uh, when it got very late at night, uh, John would always say, uh, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> <laughs> and so I am um, channeling John at this moment to let you know that uh, Bill, is going to move out there and sign copies of his book, so please go out there. But before you leave, please thank this great panel.